We've come to the central part of our worship service this morning where we're going to open God's word and listen to him speak to us. This is a great time to really seek to see Jesus. And for the past number of weeks, we've been considering what are called the I am claims in John's gospel. Today, we have an I am statement. It's not technically one of the I am claims, but through these words of Jesus, they're very simple. We really see who he is and why he came. So I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 19. We're going to read these words from verses 28 to 30. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Three simple words Jesus said as he was dying on the cross, I am thirsty. What's really interesting about this scripture passage in these three words is that they're prefaced by a statement that scripture would be fulfilled. Now that everything had been completed and finished so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Of course, one of the most interesting questions is, which scripture? How was it fulfilled? And we're going to take some time to look through the Bible to see what it was that Jesus accomplished and how all of scripture was fulfilled. I think that this particular image and these words of Jesus, I am thirsty, is just pregnant with meaning. And so let's dive in. When Jesus said, I am thirsty, first of all, it was meant to indicate the physical pain that Jesus was suffering. Of course, most of us don't live in a really arid climate, in a kind of desert environment where if you go for very long without water, your tongue just starts to stick to the roof of your mouth, and, and it can even be painful. At that time, Jesus, of course, was being crucified, and he had just spent the entire night being beat up, whipped, scourged. He had had not had anything to drink whatsoever the entire time. And, you know, our bodies are made of water. He had lost a lot of blood. And so, because this was an arid climate, and because it had gone on for so long, uh, there was a physical pain to Jesus' thirst, so that when he said, I am thirsty, it was like the culmination of all that he had been through. Listen, there's an interesting study you can do if you look at all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. One of the things you'll find out is that Jesus was actually offered a drink three times in the midst of his crucifixion. The first time's recorded in Matthew and Mark, and it happened right at 9 in the morning. Jesus was crucified at 9 in the morning. It happened right then as they arrived at Golgotha, as the cross was being hoisted up, as nails were being driven through Jesus' hands and his feet. Some of his followers came, and they offered him a drink of wine, and Matthew and Mark say it was mixed with gall and myrrh. Gall, of course, is a poison so that uh, death would be hastened. Myrrh is a painkiller so that the pain would be deadened. And the Bible says that when Jesus tasted it and it touched his lips, he actually spat it out and refused to drink it. He refused to take in poison to hasten death or myrrh uh, to deaden the pain. And by this we learn just who Jesus was, that he came to suffer. Uh, he would not in any way take shortcuts to rise above the pain or stand above it. He came into this world to suffer, to experience the depths of our pain and our trouble and our suffering. And there was nothing that he was going to be spared from. And so when he was offered a, a quick off-ramp, so to speak, where either death could be hastened or, or the pain could be deadened, Jesus refused because he came to suffer. Uh, there was tremendous physical pain on the cross. In fact, the word excruciating, excruciating pain, comes from the word cross, crucifixion. And it's the most intense pain we know. Uh, that was the kind of pain that Jesus was in when he cried out, I am thirsty. 
the second time Jesus was offered a drink, and I say offered a drink, actually happened right before noon. He had been hanging on the cross for about three hours, and there were soldiers who were there who decided to start mocking him. And they actually cried out to him, Hail, King of the Jews, uh, let us serve you. And they apparently had a goblet and some wine, and they held it up like they were going to, to serve Jesus in a mocking tone. One of the things you have to know about crucifixion, it wasn't just the physical pain. That was also designed to inflict emotional pain. Uh, signs were hung above the criminals. Passerbys would mock them and make fun of them. And Jesus wasn't spared any of this. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. You think about crucifixion itself. You know, clothes were removed from people and they were meant to hang like this. You know, if I had to be in public naked, of course, I would try the best I can to, to cover myself, but they were exposed to all kinds of shame. Well, that was the second time that he was offered a drink. Of course, the drink never made it to his lips at all. Here in John's Gospel, John chapter 19 is the third time that Jesus was offered a drink. It's only after everything had been completed and so that we might know the depths of his suffering, he said, I am thirsty. Now, the Old Testament speaks about the physical pain that the Messiah would have to suffer. Psalm 22, which begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? includes these words. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. There was extreme pain, both mental and physical, that Jesus suffered as he hung there on the cross. And so these words, I am thirsty, indicate to us the depths of that physical and emotional suffering. Now, there's a second way in which Jesus' words, I am thirsty, fulfill Scripture. And in order to understand that, I want you to understand that if you study the Gospel of John, there's actually a theme that runs through it having to do with water. For instance, when we first meet Jesus in John chapter 1, uh, this story begins with John the Baptist, who is in the Jordan River baptizing people with water. And John sees Jesus in the distance, and he points him out and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When you get to the second chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus' first miracle, if you remember it, is turning water into wine. There's another interesting incident in chapter 4 where Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at a well. Uh, the time is noon, right in the middle of the day. It's not a time where people would normally go and draw water. Uh, one of the things that we'll learn is that this woman was an outcast. Um, we'll learn that she's been through a lot in her life and that other people probably rejected her. Uh, in those days, you didn't go to draw water alone. You certainly didn't go in the middle of the day when it was the hottest. Uh, but there she is by herself. And Jesus comes upon her and he says, listen, can you uh, draw me some water? And as the woman is drawing water from the well, Jesus turns to her and says, listen, if you had known who was asking you, you would have asked me uh, to give you something to drink. And uh, she turns to Jesus and says, listen, I, the well's deep here and you don't have anything to draw with. And it's interesting what Jesus says he turns to the woman and he says, everyone who drinks this water, and he's referring to the well water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Uh, what's Jesus saying? He's saying, look, there's physical water and uh, you're drawing that for me. Whoever drinks this water, of course, You've got to keep returning to this physical water, but I have a water that if you drink it, you'll never be thirsty again. Of course, Jesus isn't talking about physical water anymore. He's talking about something more spiritual. Call it water for the soul. Well, what's Jesus talking about? I would submit to you that all of us hunger and thirst from the depths of our soul. 
And the thing that we're hungering and thirsting for is God. We need, desperately need God. In fact, Psalm 63 puts it this way. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. This particular woman at the well, uh, she was searching for something. We learn later when Jesus speaks to her that she's had five husbands and now she's on to a sixth guy who's not her husband. She has this void in her heart. She's an outcast. She's isolated. She keeps trying to fill that void in her heart with relationships and nothing is quite satisfying. That's the spiritual thirst that Jesus is addressing. And I would suggest we all have that. Our souls are crying out with thirst to be quenched by something. There's nothing in this world that can quench it. The Old Testament in particular speaks about this in the book of Jeremiah chapter 2. Uh, these are the words we read there. My people have committed two sins. Here's the first sin. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. Here's the second sin. And they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. Here's the idea. It's like there's two things happening at the same time. First, God could satisfy our souls. God could be there for us, but we've left him. We've forsaken him. And instead of turning back to him, we've now compounded this with a second error, which is we've tried to satisfy our thirst with other things that just don't work. Now, I know many of us right now are concerned about our physical health. Many of us right now are concerned about our mental health. But I'd really ask you to consider your soul's health right now. And I'd like you to consider that perhaps uh, this is true about you. That not only have you left God, the one thing that could quench the thirst of your soul, but instead you're trying to replace him with other things. What are the broken cisterns that we're replacing God with? Well, I think there are four different possibilities, all of which start with the letter P. Here's the first one, people. Now, this is what we do. We sometimes think to ourselves, boy, if I get that love, if I have that relationship, he or she will complete me. Yes, I don't feel complete now, but if I get that love or if this romantic interest you know, comes through, then I'll, everything about me will be complete and I'll never be thirsty again. Of course, that's not true. People will never replace the thirst we have in our soul for God. Here's the second thing, possessions. We know what this is like. There's a new phone that comes out. There's a new computer that comes out. There's a new car that comes out. There's a new boat that we could have. And we think to ourselves, if I just get that, if I just get that new phone, if I just get that new computer, if I just get that new boat, if I just get that new car, if I just get that new house, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be satisfied. Then my heart will be content. Then I'll have peace. Of course, most of us have enough experience to know that that's not true. We've gotten new phones, we've gotten new computers, we've gotten new cars, and it's just like the smell of the new car wears off the moment we get it. These possessions do not replace our soul's thirst for God. Number three, places. We know right now that we're not satisfied. We think to ourselves, well, I've just got to get out of this grind. Some of us, actually moved to Florida, we thought to ourselves, well, if I can just get away from gray skies and I can get to a sunny place where there's a paradise, then all my troubles will melt away and my soul will be satisfied and I'll never thirst again, of course. Uh, those of us who live in Florida know that's not true. Our problems follow us. Some of us think, well, if I can just get away on this vacation, if I can go and visit that beautiful place or I can go and stay here, if I can travel there or do this, we think, then my soul will be satisfied. But, you know, all those trips do nothing more but inflame our need and our thirst for what our souls are really thirsting for. Number four, position. Here's what we think to ourselves: if I just get that degree, if I can just achieve that pedigree, 
if I can just get that particular job or enter into that particular industry, if I can just be recognized with that award, or if I can just get that kind of fame or celebrity, then everything will be okay inside of me. Then my soul will be satisfied. Of course, that's not true. Here's what I'm trying to say. People, possessions, position, all these things, they don't satisfy their broken cisterns. Our souls need God. Can't you see that? That's what we're hungering and thirsting for. Now, the reason I mention all this is that I think there's something interesting going on. That the one person who said, if you come and drink the water I have to give, you'll never be thirsty again. In fact, springs of living water will bubble up inside of you. And boy, what an image. I mean, a well, of course, you can, you can cover over. But a spring of living water, I mean, if you try to cover it, the water just keeps bubbling up, which I think the meaning is this, that no matter what life throws at you, no matter what problems come, uh, that water will still find a way out. Um, here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you come to me, you'll never be thirsty again. That water will always be there. It's interesting that on the cross, Jesus, the source of living water, said, I am thirsty. And of course, what he's getting at is the main theme of the Bible, substitution. You see, he came to take our place. Our souls are the ones that are hurting. Our souls are the ones that are thirsty. Jesus is the living water. He is the spring of water that wells up to eternal life. And yet, he came to take our place, to suffer in our place, to bear our sin, to bear our shame. And so as he was there on the cross, he, he indicated that it wasn't just physical suffering he was experiencing. He was experiencing deep anguish of soul as he was separated away from God himself. He took our place. Now, there's a third way in which when Jesus said, I am thirsty, he fulfilled scripture. And this one's really particular, and it's interesting. Of course, when Jesus was crucified, it took, it took place at a time that was during the Jewish festival of the Passover. And the Passover, of course, was uh, an annual ceremony where the Israelites remembered a particular event. And this was the event. Back in their history, uh, God had called a man named Moses to go to Pharaoh to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Of course, if you know the story, Pharaoh hardened his heart. He would not let the Israelites go. He had enslaved them, was, was treating them ruthlessly. Uh, but what happened was there was a series of 10 plagues, one plague, then another, and then another, which finally culminated in the 10th plague. Sometimes that plague is called the plague of the firstborn. It's often always called the Passover as well, because the angel of death passed over the land and put to death so many of the firstborn children in every house. The only ones that were spared were those who, if there was a lamb, and the lamb had been slaughtered in the place of the firstborn, and the blood of that lamb had been painted on the doorposts. I want to read the scripture passage from Exodus to just key into a particular detail there. Exodus chapter 12 says this, Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. Now, I particularly want you to see that there's a bunch of hyssop that was used in order to paint the blood on the doorposts. There was this particular kind of plant. Anyway, I want you to see this detail again that when Jesus said, I am thirsty, there was this jar of wine vinegar was there. Those who were nearby soaked a sponge in it, and they put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant. Here, this is a really visual image. I brought with me a 
picture of a hyssop plant. And it's almost like you need to see this. This hyssop plant was the plant that was used to paint blood, the blood of a substitute, a sacrifice, on the doorposts of families so that there wouldn't be any death and the angel of death would pass over and life would be there instead of death. That same plant now shows up at the cross of Jesus. And it's like John, when he writes his gospel, he wants you to see this together, that Jesus, in fact, is the Lamb of God, as John said, who takes away the sin of the world. It's his blood. When we claim it for ourselves, when it's on the doorposts of our hearts and life that causes us to, to pass from death to life. And this visual image is right there so that Scripture would be fulfilled. That's why Jesus said, I am thirsty. And I just want you to see the depths of Jesus' suffering. That physically and emotionally, he didn't rise above the pain. He entered into it for you. That spiritually, in the depths of his soul, he, he went through tremendous agony and torture of soul for you. You know, the Bible says that our souls are hungering and thirsting for God. But I want you to know that on the cross, God was saying, I'm thirsty for you. And I want you to see this picture. This is who Jesus is. He came to save you. He came to fill your life with joy. He came to be a rock that you could steady your life on. He came to be a substitute to take your place so that he could give you life, real life. He suffered tremendously so that a spring of water could bubble up into your life no matter what the world would throw at you. And I invite you to come to him. Thanks so much for viewing this sermon. I hope you enjoyed it. For more content like this, please subscribe below and I'll see you next time.